Welcome to Inner Studio. Today we continue uh, looking at the Egyptian Revolution. Uh, I'll ask my guests to introduce themselves, so please start. Uh, my name is Mitwali Amr, and uh, I am a Professor Emeritus at California State University, Sacramento, in the College of Business. And I'm also the Executive Director and the founder of Salam Islamic Center in Sacramento. Hi, my name is Sarah Musa. I am the Vice Chair of the Arab American Caucus in the California Democratic Party, as well as a uh, Egyptian activist here in Sacramento. Wonderful. Uh, thank you for having me, Dr. Hamza. My name is, my name is Ashraf Sadiq. I am the communication lead from the Egyptian American Strategic Alliance, which is the first lobby organization in the US. And um, we're definitely excited about being here today. I welcome all of you. Thank you very much for joining me today. Uh, two points I, I came to my mind this, uh, today. Uh, I was calling to my, my older sister today to wish her a happy Mother's Day. Today is the Mother's Day in yes. Egypt. And uh, of course, we talked again about Egypt. And, and she said, most women are really afraid to go outside because a lot of, been, a lot of women have been mistreated outside. They, they uh, uh, either pull him or, or you say, so he said, now they're forcing women just to stay home. And it looked like the brotherhood just want to take the women back like 100, 200 years ago. So that's one point. The other point that came to my, to been watching on TV, all the different station now, is the allocation of part of the Sinai for the Palestinian people so they, they can live the, the, the other areas for Israel. Mm. And a lot of Egyptians are really upset about that. Mm. Of course, uh, uh, President Morsi and Hamas connection is really strong. So these are two points. Anyone, if you like to address any of, of the issues on women, well, I heard about it in the news, and I know what's going on uh, from reading and watching, and it's really disturbing uh, to hear that. And uh, in the meantime, really, I'm very proud of our Egyptian uh, women, sisters, who really are part of the revolution from day one, and like to continue also struggling uh, to gain their freedom and civil rights as Egyptians. So I kind of want to address your point in a two-prong effort. So you're saying that, um, or at least maybe the, the prominent um, discourse is that women are being told to stay at home because, by the Brotherhood as a way to keep them at home and prevent them from taking part in society. I think I'm going to have to disagree with you. I may not agree with everything that the Brotherhood does, but I don't think that the Brotherhood is perpetuating this kind of a, um, a regulation or a rule upon women for that reason. I think that there is a tremendously large amount of harassment, um, sexual harassment that has occurred in Egypt before the revolution and after. Perhaps after this revolution. Who's doing the harassment? A great question. I haven't been able to answer it since I've been visiting okay. Egypt and, well, since I was born. My feeling that a lot of brotherhood are doing that. I don't know if you see the picture it, on, uh, on the uh, brotherhood headquarters in there where a man slammed a woman in her face, got her down in the ground. Did you see that? I, I didn't see that. Yeah, However, it, I, I, you know, it can, there can be... There can be bad apples in all sorts of organizations. Perhaps these people are not people that the Brotherhood affiliates with, but the peop those folks that are perpetuating this violence affiliate themselves with the Brotherhood and their speaking and their ideals. So, uh, you know, I can't I can't speak to who is actually perpetuating this sexual harassment, but we know that it's on the rise, and we know that women are afraid to leave their homes, not because they're being told to not leave the house, but because they are frustrated, as women are here in America, that this rape culture of, oh, you look, the way that you look and the way that you dress is what made somebody want to perpetuate some sort of sexual violence against you. It's really a matter of the people that are perpetuating this violence doing that for their own their, oh, whatever reason they have. It's not because of what the woman's wearing. It's not because of whatever. So in, in essence, Whatever the women do, they will still be harassed. So why leave? Why would they leave the house? They would be more, ha they'd be happier there. Why I think the Brotherhood is, is, is um, promoting this type of a rule is because they can't control the violence. 
they would rather have women not leave and the violence decrease because of the sheer lack of women that people can harass rather than find the root solution to the problem. Because there's so many problems in Egypt right now, that's not on their top priority list. They blame all the uh, uh, harassment on the women. They don't... Right. They, uh, uh, and it happens in America, too. It's because she's too. out. They, the, the Muslim Brotherhood... And if they on go that for, point, I disagree. Absolutely. They I, do. I dis absolutely. They, they do actually blame the women. They don't blame anybody else. Because why is she outside? She should be in the... In the well, they may be saying... An that, that's what we heard so many times. And the discourse may be, oh, you, she knows that she's going to be harassed if she leaves. Why did she leave? Okay. Until, and it's, I think they're bringing it from a, the problem exists, why leave your house, rather than women belong in the house. I don't think, I think the Muslim Brotherhood is beyond that mentality. Some people may disagree, and there have been some rules, that, some laws that people have tried to pass in the, the parliament that speak otherwise. But I'd like to give them the benefit of the doubt, and I'd like to, to say, Perhaps they're saying it as a, the problem exists, they should stay at home, rather than there's a problem and we need to solve it. My, uh, my nephew is working in Saudi Arabia and his daughter now in university. So he said he's going to finish his work, he's going to resign from Saudi Arabia so he can take his daughter back and forth to the college because he's, he doesn't feel that she's safe anymore. Mm -hmm. She's not. And, and, and this is a general feeling among many of the young girls, or even older uh, <laughs> ladies. They're just afraid to leave the house because they could be sexually harassed or could be uh, really uh, harmed in any different way. The reason why she's not is because the minute he says, I don't, I'm afraid that she's going to ha this is going to happen to her, her chance of being harassed increases tenfold. But if he equips her with the right strategies on how to ask for help, how to go out with the right people and to be surrounded by the right people that will support her, she'll be fine. I admire your if optimism. I, go ahead. If I may, may jump in. When I introduced myself, I said that I am the communication lead for the Egyptian American Strategic Alliance. And if you remember President Obama running for elections the first time and the second time, the main reason or the main platform that he used to run for elections was a platform of hope. And our goal within the organization that we set up is to really help the US government itself understand that the Egyptian people are looking for the same freedoms and values that the American society enjoys mm -hmm. by virtue of a stellar constitution that still lives until today. The Egyptian people are looking for that hope. And the issue that we're talking about is an issue between what is right now happening in Egypt and what could be. And the fact that the discourse, that the first thing that is top of mind for you right now is the issue of women in Egypt, tells us a couple of things. Number one, there are forces in Egypt that have basically succeeded in shifting the focus from the aspirations of 85 million people to the aspirations of subsets of the 85 million people. Yeah. One of those subsets is the Egyptian women. And of course, there is no denial of these issues and the fact that people are not feeling safe. The other subsets of that society have to do with the minorities in this, in this society in general. But I actually want us to stay at the very top of the 85 million people. The 85 million people in Egypt today do not feel the stability, the freedom, the justice that they looked for when they started the revolution. The current administration in Egypt needs to remind everyone of why the revolution started and start delivering on the promise of that revolution. It is sad that we're starting to talk about fringe benefits and not the main benefits. That's really where I think we should be talking about what is happening today and what could be. And when we take a look at the performance of the Egyptian government today, the fact that today Moody's organization has downgraded yep. Egypt for the second time in a row. So that. The first time happened in February and the second time happened today which aggravates the economic situation of the Egyptian people. The Egyptian people are unfortunately not going to be able to get the money they need to sustain the economy. Now, I want, and I'm calling as the Arab, as the Egyptian American Strategic Alliance, I am calling on all Americans who love freedom and want the same values and freedoms that the American people enjoy to be enjoyed by other people around the world and specifically the Egyptian people. And I say that as an American Egyptian 
who really wants the stability and the security of American interests in the Middle East. A stable and democratic Egypt is the apple of the eye of the Egyptian citizen. And that's really what we need to focus the conversation. It's unfortunate that the current leadership in Egypt have taken the conversation to a very sad state. We're now talking about the fact that Egyptian women are not safe in Egyptian streets. We're forgetting the fact that 85 to, uh, to 90 million Egyptians are not really enjoying the freedoms that they called for. And now we are on the brink of economic collapse. Security collapse is already in operation. And we can call, we can blame a lot of people. We can blame the opposition. We can blame Egyptians outside, the, outside Egypt. We can blame the, the, uh, the current administration. But the issue is it is a failure of leadership in Egypt today. And all leaders in Egypt need to cooperate to save Egypt. That is the crux of the issue right, right now, especially for the 85 million Egyptians, mm -hmm. everybody included. It is an issue of leadership today in Egypt. That is the crux of the matter. They have failed to come together, whether it's the opposition or the Morsi administration, to really bring solid, hopeful, optimistic, and real change for the Egyptian people. Now the IMF is going to walk out the door. Money that is in Egypt is going to walk out the door. And people are standing in line and fighting for their life just to get gas for their cars, let alone the bread. They can't even go to work. So I want us to bring that hope back that we all felt so elated, we almost cried when that revolution succeeded, and we almost cried when President Morsi won the elections. Today, President Morsi, unfortunately, cannot go back to the Hadir Square because he has destroyed so much political capital that he enjoyed at that moment. He cannot go back to the Hadir Square. President Morsi needs to do a lot of things in order to be able to go back to that place where people died and say, I have committed a number of mistakes and I am here today to correct those mistakes and I will make promises to you to fix those mistakes and I'm going to take this country to a level of stability and predictability that will bring back the economy to a much better state. That's not gonna happen. Uh, President Morsi is not the ruler. President Morsi is not the ruler. The ruler is the leadership of the brotherhood. And if you follow the news for the past few days, the diplomats, instead of going to Tahideya or go to the presidential palace, they go to the Brotherhood uh, headquarter. The, um, the Italian ambassador, <coughs> William Schneer, uh, Khalid Mishal from the, uh, from the Palestinian leadership in Gaza, also went to, he, he, they, they don't go to presidential palace, they go to to the uh, headquarter of the Brotherhood in Muqattam. And, and many others, so I'm just cited two, two examples. So, I, the, and, and, and President Morsi, it's a really very difficult situation, <coughs> very difficult situation. Uh, President Morsi is known to be elected in a free election. Uh, even if he leaves now, who's gonna take that? It's becoming really, really complicated issue. No one would wanna <coughs> Uh, step in for after so many things got ruined out. Economic is really bad, social life is bad, uh, 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 a lot of people have no jobs, people are not safe in the street. It's just really awful situation. So where, where do we go from here? So, so I, I, I think, uh, I think you know, even, if, even if we say it's the MBs, the MB who are, who are in control, for them to succeed, it's very obvious, even though the opposition may be actually messing things up for them. It's true. The problem is this is a situation, very much the situation that a CEO who takes a company that, need, that needs a turnaround has to face the fact that he has to work with the 200 to 300 top vice presidents in the company and make sure that they are all aligned on the same priorities that he wants to achieve. If that doesn't happen, we're not going to be able to move forward. This is the main issue. In Egypt, if these leaders come together and say, what we are interested in is making sure that this country becomes a better country, then we have hope. And that's exactly what I want us to achieve. What I'm really hoping that the, <clears throat> these leaders can really turn around and bring hope back in the hearts of Egyptians. That is what is at stake today. If hope leaves the house, 
which right now I think it is on its way out, people will basically walk to the borders. They are today everybody would want to step out of get off this ship because the captain doesn't know what he's doing. The captain most of the time doesn't know what he's saying. The captain most of the time changes direction every single day. And now the joke has been, let's just wait till the morning. Maybe he changes his mind. We need to fix all those fundamental issues that have to deal with how do I run a country? This is not a village in the south of Egypt. It is not a village in the south of Egypt. It's the largest Arab country in the Middle East. Yeah. And the U.S. government has to really have a very clear policy because right now we, based on what I'm reading and based on what we're hearing from D.C., the U.S. government today is not really providing a very clear direction to where they want things to go in Egypt. They are happy with how the relationship with Israel today is, but with such an unpredictable environment, things can blow up in our face one more time in the Middle East. And that's really what I'm hoping that the leaders in D.C. can really send a very clear message to the administration in Egypt, because otherwise, things are going to really fall apart. And that's what I want. It's already falling apart. Well, again, I'm it's still hopeful. It, it really is falling I'm still apart. hopeful. I want to give yeah. the Egyptian people promise and hope that tomorrow is, a, is going to be a better day. And I believe Egypt has the leaders to, do, to make that happen if they come to the table and say, yes, this is a great nation. We need to make sure that history will not say we mess things up. In the meantime, <clears throat> the United States really is caught in the middle of, of uh, the opposition and you know, the government. Yes. Uh, when the Secretary of the State went to Egypt, some of the opposition really refused to meet with him. Yes. And thus, really, America is really caught in the middle of those kind of two opposing views. Yes. Uh, one thing really I'd like to focus on is really, uh, Morsi was elected uh, in free election, number yes. one. He was really the head of the Freedom and Justice Party, which is an extended arm of the Muslim Brotherhood, and they supported him. And thus, he should be loyal to his party, like um, Obama is loyal to the Democrats and Bush was loyal to the Republicans. This is a fact of political life. Mm -hmm. And thus, unfortunately, the opposition is not giving him the chance and the Muslim Brotherhood the chance to really rule the country for four years and see what will happen. Right. Uh, definitely after six years of military regime, and, and the, uh, the uh, Nasser, and then Sadat, and then Mubarak. 60 years of that kind of oppression. Mm -hmm. Now the Egyptians, for the first time, really are smelling the, the fresh air of freedom. Oh, I don't think so. And then, really. Well, look, to the, look to the news. It's very oppressive Read the newspaper. Right uh, watch the television. For the first time, everyone really speaks up his own mind or her own mind. That definitely did not happen under Mubarak and or under Sadat or under Nasser. Now, definitely, they are speaking up for the first time. Uh, they are excited about the freedom. Uh, they are definitely opposing the, the Muslim Brotherhood because they are afraid of them. And, and thus, really, this is the reason for the chaos. I hope the opposition really give the time to the Muslim Brotherhood mm -hmm. to really prove themselves. If they failed, kick them out. This is number one. Number two, I heard today, and definitely in, in the past few days, the pressure is on the government to do something about the economic condition and then the, uh, the, the security as well. Mm -hmm. And I've heard really that they are going to meet and establish a new coalition government uh, from all kinds of uh, political parties. Uh, and I really hope that would lead to the, a little bit more stability and also the economic development. Mm -hmm. In fact, Amr Musa mentioned that, that let's really have a, a, a coalition government to really lead Egypt and then to focus on the economic development and the security. And then forget about the parliament election until uh, after, after the, uh, the Eid al-Fitr, which will be in August. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, think the, I think really the uh, opposition don't have power in the street. Really, they, the opposition don't, they don't have that many people. But to, they go and demonstrate in Medina Tahrir. Those, those are not opposition. Those are people, those are 
general people, okay. people who have no jobs, people who cannot feed their children, people who stand in long lines. And those to are the bread. Egyptian people. Yeah. Uh, those are the Egyptian people. Exactly. But they may uh, align themselves with the opposition because they're against why be, be, because the government. Because they the are sick of what happened. Right. So they're saying, I'm, I, I'm opposing what the government yeah. is or, in this case, is not doing. Yeah. So. I mean, I think that the opposition really does have a large number, mm -hmm. and it's growing because yeah. every day that Morsi doesn't do something or Morsi's cabinet doesn't do something about the economic, the social, the political, the whatever situation is a day that he, the opposition increases in numbers. Yeah. And definitely the opposition would force, really, I feel like the position of the Muslim Brotherhood or the government really are changing because they are listening. They cannot just continue like that. They are aware of the economic right. chaos. Mm -hmm. They are aware of the lack of, of security. They are, aware of, uh, they are aware of what is happening to, to women on the street. But and thus, they are forced really to yield to the pressure from the opposition. And I'm really very hopeful, mm -hmm. again, if, if the message is hope, that they will come to their senses, hey, we have to do something. If they listen, if the they listen. But my, my impression, yeah. we've been, uh, this past nine months, Things went from bad to worse to worse to worse. Sure. There, is no, there is no improvement. But don't blame uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, Dr. Hamza, who, only. Who, 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 who have the, the opposition who is, the help? The opposition is not giving them the opportunity to prove themselves. The Salafi also have their own demands and also they're missing up things. I think In that fact, going back to the uh, woman issue, it is possible that it is not the Muslim Brotherhood, but the Salafi are really more conservative and definitely like to have women stay home and it is possible some of the representatives are really doing that, not, not, not the Muslim Brotherhood. But I, here, I'm thinking, here's what I think. They have had the time to make changes. I feel that the leadership of the Muslim Brotherhood and the government, the, the, the presidency and the administration is in a very reactionary mood. They're not taking proactive measures to resolve problems mm -hmm. that have existed before they took office, let alone after. I feel every day is, wait, we have to hear what Morsi's going to say. Mm -hmm. Why doesn't Morsi have something proactive to say? Why does he have to react to what the opposition is saying? Mm -hmm. He, has, he knows who the key stakeholders are. He knows that in order to get anything done, they have to sit together, whether they like each other or not, whether they agree or not, and they have to sit down and figure out a solution to it. And if there's no, if, they, if he is unable to get people at the table, then he has to try again. But because when we saw the fiscal cliff in America, we saw Obama go out and find Republicans. Little, he, he was looking at rank and file Republicans. He wasn't even going just to the key leadership of the Republican Party. And the Republicans, too, were agreeing to go and meet with Obama. But he didn't stop. He didn't just send an email and say, hey, come on out, or put it on TV and say, Hey, we're you know we're gonna meet tomorrow at six o'clock. My house have some tea. It was I'm gonna sit with you. I'm gonna talk with you. I'm gonna learn about your issues. Whether we agree or not, I will find a way to make it work. Mm -hmm. And he hasn't showed that proactive. But let us nature. really let us really focus on the meaning of democracy. When a, a party won the election, that party by definition, political definition, should be in charge. Right. Can I what happened? What yeah. happened again? Not necessarily. To, what yeah. happened to the parliament when it was really uh, formed again? The uh, Supreme Council of the, mil of, of the Armed Forces and some of the, uh, the courts went ahead and dissolved that, uh, that, 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 that uh, parliament, which really majority of them <coughs> were Muslim Brotherhood. And oh. definitely this was unfair to them after they won the election. Right. And definitely, they have the right to react to that kind of yeah. things, although they accepted the dissolution of the parliament, who really belongs to them. And, and that, this, is, this was, was not fair. And they have to react naturally right. to right. what happened. Uh, I, I think, again, I want to go back to the whole issue of leadership in Egypt. And <clears throat> we are all aware of the circumstances and the conditions of these elections. And I think ignoring the circumstances and the conditions and basically saying he won the elections, we do know that he won the elections. The question is, what do you do about this victory knowing the circumstances that the Egyptian people as a whole were put in? They were put in between two choices that the average Egyptian citizen, if you told him to choose, he would not choose either of them. And we ended up choosing the least worse of the two choices. If I am the one who was chosen in that way, right? Mm -hmm. If I am the, the manager of a company who was chosen and I know that the half 
more than 50% of that population is re reluctantly voted for me, reluctantly, yeah. right? Yeah. I have a big issue on my hands. Mm -hmm. Number one, I need to understand what the reluctance was, right? Mm -hmm. So that I don't blindly and just brush it away and say, I won, you know, and yeah. why doesn't everybody just comply? So that philosophy is really why we have a lot of issues today. So if we were to authentically address the situation, we will say, yes, the elections, yes, happened by votes. But as a president, I was voted in in a situation where obviously people were in a very tough spot. This is not the American elections where people saw Mitt Romney through more than a year and a half espousing his platform and espousing his, his, uh, uh, his policies and what President Obama wanted to do, and this, again, you're, you're, you're basically talking about a long period of time. The situation here, Egyptians were basically put in a situation where you're either going to go this way or that way, and both choices were very tough. If I go into office bearing that in mind, then my behavior is going to show the fact that I have to work really hard to enroll all this opposition so that we can come to an agreement that we can work together mm -hmm. and push the country, the country mm -hmm. forward. That process, unfortunately, hasn't happened. And most of those dialogues that President Morsi has tried to accomplish, and yes, people did not cooperate, and yes, he has really failed to have very substantive, authentic conversations. Mm -hmm. Now, we clearly know that there are big issues that the opposition is uh, focusing on. The Attorney General, the way he was brought into office, and the fact that he is very much like my great-grandma, he has very selective uh, judgment in terms of what to pursue and what not to pursue. Pursuing the black bloc and not pursuing other groups that have committed crimes outside the presidential palace. The process by which the Constitution was drafted, there is a lot of opposition and anger in people. If I ignore that anger, I'm not a good leader. Anyone who understands the psychology of human beings, if you force me to do something, I'm not going to do it. Thirdly, the, the current government, obviously we know that the people are chosen, the way people are being recruited today is only based on their allegiance to the Muslim Brotherhood. That's not going to save a country that is in a turnaround situation. You give me hope when you bring in the experts. When you go to a specialist a heart, for a heart surgery, is much better than going to someone who is supposed to take care of animals, when I, what I need is a, is a doctor that need, knows how to take care of human hearts, right? So these are obvious issues. And the current administration is really basking in the <clears throat> sun, saying, I was voted in. Oh, of course you were voted in. I'm happy for you. But if you cannot run the business, the business is not going to Absolutely. really succeed. Absolutely. I, I want to pick right? on this point. Yeah. So that's the issue. I need to, yeah. We need to acknowledge what's going on, because without acknowledging yeah. them, I, they're bound to blow up in my face. Okay. Somebody's been elected by the people, as you said, even, even let's say, he got a, a popular vote. Let's like, just assume the worst. He, yes. And this guy doesn't know how to manage. He doesn't know how to rule. He always blamed the opposition. The opposition won't let me rule. What excuse is that? I mean, you're at the helm, you have all the powers, and you can rule. I think the best thing for him, either leave or, or find another way to elect another president. Or because uh, the, now we're going from, during Mubarak, we were much better off than we are now. People had jobs. People. Or now, another option. Now things are going bad and worse. And it's, it's not or another option. Respect the democracy and in the vote of the people and give them, give them a chance. Opposition. What do you mean give, give him, him the chance? chance. He's, he's at the helm. Well, as he's the, at the helm. As the, who's well, going to give him? Who, who's going to give him? He cannot, who, he cannot rule who? while you have the Medan at Tahrir. Demonstration all the time. They go to his palace at the al Tahrir. Because he does things wrong. If you keep doing the wrong things, you're going to have this reaction. Again, if you do the right thing, the vote, you won't have that. The people voted for him to rule Egypt for four years, he and his party. And that's exactly we, what they want. We have to, to respect that. Yeah. The fact that Even if people it, psychologically did not like the Muslim Brotherhood because they are fearful of what the Muslim Brotherhood no might people, do. Then they go ahead and demonstrate in front of actually, his palace and the security and the Baltagia, and he cannot really rule in this kind of... So really, it is us Egyptian people who really does not respect the democracy I, and in I, the vote I of the people and let the, the Muslim Brotherhood, their party, 
and the one who elected to be the president for four years let him uh, give him the chance but I to don't, rule out. I don't think that the Muslim Brotherhood has respected democracy. I don't think that they have respected the minorities that have elected him. He was elected, I, I, I always try to go back to this point, um, only in the initial round, he received only 20% of the vote. And so only 20% of Egyptians wanted him into power. And like Mashaf was saying, they had to choose between what they feel may be yeah. was the lesser of two evils. Yeah. Being sure. presented with two options that you're not excited about is not a favorable election, mm -hmm. but it is the election that they had to pursue. Many people did not vote entirely. I understand that that was a very popular thing to do as a means of protesting that vote, but he, he was elected at the end of the day and only by 20% of people that actually really truly wanted him, yeah. the number which has dwindled down since then. To, again, that, uh, to practice democracy is to be respectful of the rest of the 80 percent and to take those views into consideration yeah. and to be uh, to be to be working with them rather than working above them and you'd have to be present mm -hmm. of all the people yeah. not only the brotherhood he is just trying to be a president of the brotherhood and that's a, that's a big mistake dr hamza think. i think as our brother said here at the beginning i think he was very popular he got 75% of the Egyptian people, the first few months he ruled, he was really the man of the people. He went to Medan al without any, any protection until the opposition started and gave him hard time to the extent that he, he really feels helpless. Uh, yeah. Right. Which, which is, is a point. Is... a point I'd like to respond to you, by yeah. the way. Mm -hmm. George W. Bush wrote, uh, won by how, how many votes? In, 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 in right. My, in 2000, Correct. 500 votes, Florida, remember? And then definitely Americans vote, uh, accepted. It went even to the court. And look to what he did, being president. You know, we, we took us to the war in, in Afghanistan and also in, in Iraq, and then the rest is history. So by, by definition of democracy, 20% voted is not our, it is not their mistake. Uh, but in the final analysis, he won democratically, and thus for four years, right. uh, from so the political party, which years? is the Muslim Brotherhood, I think we should give him the chance. By the end of but four years, there will be no Egypt, I can tell you that. Right. Yeah. If you continue the way it is, if you continue right. the way it is, right. yeah. and then because people really are experiencing freedom for the first time, excited about it, go to Midan al dahri go to Uttahadiyya, uh, do all kinds of, of uh, but things. Uh, what can he do? They did that. Everyone should be blamed about it. They did that before mercy. They did that once Mubarak left. They did that before Mubarak left. It has nothing to do with Morsi. Morsi did not grant people freedom. Mubarak leaving granted pe people freedom. People freed themselves when they went out on January 25th, 2011. It has nothing to do with Morsi. So I, I, I have to respect, uh, respectfully disagree that Morsi granted people freedom. He absolutely did not. Yeah. They earned their freedom by themselves. And to say that, that a single entity or a person was the one that provided that, that, that up the opportunity to speak freely or to do whatever um, in the streets, protest, whatever it is that they'd like to do, but, that's not because of mercy. But the people, the Egyptian people voted for him. Is that true? By virtue of democracy, yes, he was voted in. Default, Papa. Uh, yes. And accordingly, to, uh, by virtue of democracy, if he voted for someone for four years and the, his political party supported him, there's no doubt about it, sure. shouldn't we give him the chance? Sure, but uh, we almost impeached uh, Clinton because he had a, a sex affair and uh, we're letting uh, a president run our entire country to the ground. I think that's very much so grounds for impeachment, but that's not, you know, I personally disagree with that route, but I do feel that part of democracy is to remove a, a leader that you don't feel is speaking for you or, or working for you. Mm -hmm. I think that you're better off working within the system and working within the government and trying to work with the people. I don't think that the opposition leaders are doing the right thing by saying, we are not going to meet with the president unless X, Y, Z, A, B, C are all met. And you must do this and this. There's, you can't meet with people based off of conditions. It's not an <clears throat> ultimatum to get Egypt back up and running. It's a promise and it's hope that people work together and, and unite for a, sim for a common cause. I think I agree with you at the beginning, definitely he was the man of the people. He spoke for everyone until the conflict happened. Mm -hmm. And definitely... Do you think it was the constitutional declaration that caused all of that start? I probably started from there, yeah. simply because... Yeah, yeah. And again, we really have to know his motive. He right. wanted to speed up the process of transformation into democracy, mm -hmm. have the parliament to be the, 
uh, legislative branch right. and the executive branch and so forth, and then speed up the process. Yes. And then start economic development and yes. security and so forth. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, after that, he wanted to really speed up the process. People misunderstood him. Correct. And definitely, you know, the rest of the story. If, I were, if you were to advise him how to turn things around, what would you say to him? I think I would advise him by still loyal to your party. You have the right to claim that. But in the meantime, because of the opposition is really tough, and for the first time after 60 years, they are excited about their freedom of speaking up and mm -hmm. expression of opinion. You really have to have this uh, coalition government, include all, the, uh, all the, the political parties, and then have the experience, not uh, Muslim brother or, or others, look to the technocrats and really start look focus on the economic development and security. You know, I really disagree mm -hmm. with you. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, yes, yes, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood supported him. He should be really loyal to the Egyptian people. He's not the Brotherhood anymore. It, yeah, the Brotherhood helping them through. He has a bigger, a bigger goal. He has a much higher, bigger, a bigger, bigger mandate. He higher. should be loyal to the Egyptian people, regardless whether the Muslim Brotherhood or not Muslim Brotherhood. I agree with you, but yeah. again, what we're missing is, I think, is, is, a, is a, a covenant. Right. And then worried about that that any leader from the Muslim Brotherhood, they have to be loyal to their leadership. And, and this is really what messed things up, and unfortunately. It's, mm -hmm. it's any leader from any party. I mean, <clears throat> you, it's not that you're, you're a loyal. In, I mean, define loyalty. If you mean to say you'll do whatever you, the, the leadership of that party wants you to do, that's that's not le that's not that's following blindly. I think what you what you maybe maybe if, if I'm understanding correctly, you mean to say that you want the the Muslim Brotherhood leader, so Morsi, to follow the values and the goals and the vision of the Brotherhood, um, and to apply it in a more broad way for the entire Egyptian population to be uh, to 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 work for for the entire country. It's totally fair and it's it's understandable. This mm -hmm. this pr member of a certain party was elected mm -hmm. for that for his values and for his vision. That's perfectly fair for him to stay in line with the the Muslim Brotherhood, mm -hmm. so long as he changes yeah. the way that that vision is applicable to an entire nation, not just to a party. I agree. Yeah. So I, this I, is really, I think that's where I, I I I think if I'm understanding correctly. I agree with you, and this is really the problem that Morsi is facing now. He's caught in the middle of two things, mm -hmm. working with the president of all the people right. and then being loyal to the covenant. The, the, the it's between a already. rock and a hard place. Yes. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, he really has to get out of that. He, correct. Uh, I mean, yeah, but, but now he, he, was, he was part of a Muslim Brotherhood. Now he's president of all the Egyptian. And okay. I think I, really yes. he should not, you should completely leave the Brotherhood on the side. That's, that's the, the role is finished. Now he's president of all the Egyptians, not sure. only the brethren. And he should exactly. really, so, the Muslims have a lot of Christians. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he has to really worry about this. He's still yeah. president of all these people. Absolutely. And he was that really from June yeah. until, until November. Yes. Until yeah. the, uh, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's why I'm, I'm definitely saying there was that political capital, which I think if he capitalized on that, we would have exactly. been in a totally different situation exactly. today. Yeah. Exactly. And I think still there's another layer of an issue where we still have the old guard fighting the young guard, even in the Muslim Brotherhood between the political party that they have set up, which is heavily populated by young men and women mm -hmm. who are members of the Muslim Brotherhood. Yeah. And then you have the guide office, which again is the old guard. And the old guard in a lot of ways, like a lot of other people mm -hmm. in Egypt, think whatever happened in Tahrir was a gathering of young men and women yeah. who had nothing else to do. They do not really believe that the revolution has taken mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. That belief really um, blocks them from understanding and believing Correct. what the aspirations of these people are and why young men and women in Egypt, even though they see their brothers and sisters on the street dying, they still go down to the streets and die again. And there is no shortage of these young men and women. So, well, they don't have the other so the, if, if I have wisdom in these leader, among these leaders, they would realize that the aspirations of millions of young men and women in Egypt are going to break through the door no matter how much you try to, break, to, to keep the door closed. Yep. That is the crux of the matter for the leadership in Egypt today, as it is for many other Arab leaders in, in the Middle East. It's believing and understanding that if you don't facilitate change, change will overpower you and mm -hmm. you will be drowned by it. Mm -hmm. So I think, 
I agree with you giving Grizzly and Morris a chance. Probably, I'm still one of those people who will tell you the chance has been given. The boat has many holes in it. It's drowning. And the question is, are we going to be able to patch the holes mm -hmm. soon enough before other holes open up? It only takes about 15 minutes in a speech that is heart to heart with the Egyptian people that really comes to the table and says, in a very transparent manner, these are the mistakes that were made. Tomorrow morning, this is what we're doing. My own feeling and, that, that, yeah. that brother, President Morsi is not the ruler. Uh, the, the ruler yeah. is the leadership of the brotherhood. Yes. Many of the political leadership really go to the brotherhood headquarter before they go to yeah. the presidential. And that situation and, has to be fixed. And that, that, that's part of the problem. This, I agree. Yes. I agree. And it cannot continue, really. Uh, and, and that's why, really, he cannot just speak because people don't believe him anymore. Uh, yeah, yeah, you have to have and actions backed up. Action. Yes. And then the action, really, is what is going on negotiating now between the opposition and the leadership of the, like Katatni, the, the, the head of the, uh, the former head of the, of the parliament, mm -hmm. and, and some others as well. Shatter and Badia. And, and thus, the negotiation going on under the scene, really behind the scene, is to have a new government, including the technocrats from all political parties, and Morsi leadership up. Yeah. And I'm really optimistic that this will happen in the next few weeks. Uh, another point, other than the women, really is the, uh, of course, we all know that, that Hamas was partly responsible of, of opening some prison <coughs> during the revolution and got all the brotherhood out. So there's no dispute about that. And now, uh, Morsi worked out some deal between Hamas and Israel and settled all the difference, and things are cooled down between Hamas and Israel for now. Mm. Uh, but now, I think part of the deal also is to create a piece of Sinai, or, or I don't know, it's major or, or small, they're talking about 75,000 uh, square feet. Uh, recently, the Egyptian government is preparing project to build a million residential unit in the Sinai. Mm. And, and, and then some opposition talking about the whole population of this area is 300,000. Okay. 300,000 people. So why do you need a million, a million units. residential unit mm -hmm. in the Sinai? Mm -hmm. So uh, it looks there is some deal under the table. Mm -hmm. No one has seen it yet. Yes. So how do you guys feel? Because this may be a, a, a big regional project right. where, where Israel and Egypt the and the United States and the yes. uh, European Union, they, they're just trying to solve the Palestinian-Israeli problem mm -hmm. at the expense of the Egyptian land. Yes. So how, how do you guys feel? Is it possible so, so we can have peace between... Israelis and the Palestinians, then the Sinai is, is almost like, it's a very low density population, yes. very low density. Yes. So w would that be an acceptable solution or how, how would it you It would not that? because again, well, we hear these rumors, but uh, it was denied right away by the, uh, by Sisi. the government. Is Sisi also put really a, a denial. A denial. Exactly. So he, no one is going to build anything on a border exactly. between. You know, the, the Egyptians are very sensitive to their land. And Sadat was killed simply because of the agreement mm -hmm. yeah. uh, with, with Begin in, in order to get Sinai back. Uh, even today, in, in, is, in Israel, uh, President Obama still uh, talked very, very frankly uh, about uh, having the Palestinians having their own state and the settlement really is, is continuing the settlement is an obstacle to peace and definitely encouraged them, the, the Israeli, to go ahead and, and take out of the, get out of, of, uh, of the, the West Bank and, and give the Palestinians the right of their own state. If there is something going on, Brother Hamza, like what you are talking about, uh, maybe uh, he was not really that, he would, he would have not been that strong in making the point. Mm -hmm. But really, I hear that rumor sometimes back, and it was denied completely by, by the public officials, and I really don't think that we should, uh, we should continue making this really as if it is something uh, that, that could happen. No. Because I don't think it will happen. Israel, Israel 
in complete opposition of creation of Palestinian state. They don't want no Palestinian state. Mm -hmm. Whatsoever. Well, this is not what uh, okay. Beres uh, to, uh, said today, yeah, not what the Prime no, Minister said Netanyahu. today. No. No, Netanyahu mentioned uh, yeah. yesterday or the day before. Didn't, didn't, didn't. No, he it didn't mention. Yeah, it just happened today yeah. before we came. That we are for really two states, and this is we are committed to do that. As long as this state is not in the Sinai. Mm -hmm. Well, he, he did not talk about... They didn't the, talk about uh, location. No, no, he definitely talked about really the... The West Bank, of course, and, and Gaza. Yeah. And probably there might be some, some trading, trading of land in order really to, to make the new state viable in terms of transportation, communication among its, uh, its citizens. Yeah. But I, I, I really, I, I don't like to spend time on that because we are making something really of rumor really mm -hmm. to, to, yeah. to yeah. make it as a matter, of, yeah. as, as an issue of, to talk about. Because yeah. I don't yeah. think this will will never happen, I, I, if I can make it. Okay, another issue that came yeah, out today. Yeah, please go to another issue. Another <laughs> issue that came out today. Uh -huh. The Muslim Brotherhood was a legal organization from the days of, of Sadat Nasr. and yes. Nasser and all yes. that. Yes, yes. And even up till yesterday. Yes. Up till, it was illegal up till yesterday. What do you mean by illegal? It, it's not, <coughs> it has no, has no it's not existence. It goes, it's not should not have no existence. Not, not that. It goes back to history, to Nasser, mm -hmm. back in uh, 1954, when they issued a decree by him as the president of Egypt at the time, dictator, yes, but he was the president, that the, dissol the, the, the dissolution of the... Uh, Muslim, oh, the Muslim brother. Right. As, as a group. So right. it was dissolved and, a long time. And this time. law still stands, and now some people... Uh, are reviving that and issuing a complaint to the court of uh, the highest court saying that this is the case and thus the Muslim Brotherhood does not exist. Mm -hmm. And it, now it's going on in the court and the court looked into that yeah. and it's still looking into that. Mm -hmm. This is a new issue. For, 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 from uh, yeah. when President Morsi started, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, there, there has been a loss of police protection for the headquarters of the Muslim Brotherhood. So a lot of the opposition why the, what, what is this? It's not, it's not a formal organization. It's not, it's not recognized by state. Why the police put so much right. uh, uh, protection on it? So only yesterday, only yesterday, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood submitted a request to, to consider to call it Jama'at al So it's not, it's, it's not not like a but It is really going on in the court because yeah. the argument now is uh, Abdul Nasser was a dictator, and thus his uh, decisions were not really legal or constitutional. But in the meantime, he was legally the president. He was president. He was in charge of the, uh, the constitution and, and making decisions. Yeah. And that, was the, that decision was issued. And legally, constitutionally, the Muslim Brotherhood does not exist. Yeah. Uh, and now it's, it's, it's real in the court now. Yeah. And definitely, if, if it reaches that, Fine, but they definitely they have their political party, yeah. which is well established. That's and this true. Is the at freedom least and the, justice. Yeah, mm -hmm. freedom and justice. At and, least and, and I think that's another example, yet again, of how the conversation has shifted from the revolution exactly. of 85 million people right. exactly. to a discussion about this group or that group. Right. If you ask an average Egyptian citizen, what do you want? He will tell you, I want freedom, I want social justice. And I want bread to eat. And, and I, I want, and I want yeah. to have a decent yeah. chance at living. Right? Exactly. And he's not going to really care that much about mm -hmm. the Muslim Brotherhood or any other political party if at the level of his daily life he sees an improvement. If President Morsi <clears throat> can elevate the conversation to that strategic goal of a nation, then we will be doing the right thing. We will be spending our time and effort in the right direction. Absolutely. Because right now, everybody's attention and effort is being wasted. Yeah. On, on different issues. On, yeah. on sidebar conversations. Right. While the economy is crumbling, yep. our rating outside Egypt is crumbling, our scoring on human rights and a lot of other international measures of a democratic state are failing. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about a building that's being protected and people dying in the protection of a building. Mm -hmm. That's how sad it has become. Yep. But I'm still hopeful that a leader or leaders from among the Egyptian population will come out and take this nation forward. That's really where we need to focus because it is in that that there is hope for the Egyptian people and there is stability for Egypt and also for the U.S. Uh, uh, government and the U.S. itself as an entity in terms of really 
making sure that the, that the Middle East is a stable environment for countries like Egypt to thrive and for a country like Israel to, to live in peace. And going back to that topic, I believe days will come when we're no longer talking about the Palestinian people or the Israeli people. We will be talking about a nation that houses all these people who have their own independent beliefs and religions, just like what happened in South Africa. I think what's happening right now is just basically everyone is playing for time, mm. but the day will come when these walls crumble. Even this concrete wall that the Israeli government has built will crumble. It has crumbled in South Africa even after many, many years. Mm. That's what's going to happen in that land where many religions were born. So it's no longer going to be a Jewish land or a Palestinian land. It will be a land where all these people live freely. Mm. Now, Another issue that I want to bring up, a lot of the leaders in Egypt today were imprisoned in their lifetime. And when you have such people <clears throat> running the country, throughout their life they have seen a lot of tragedies and atrocities that their mind is not necessarily looking and aspiring mm -hmm. to give a lot of these Egyptians the kind of life they, they, they hope for. They feel like if I suffered, it's okay that somebody else suffers. Yeah. We want people who are not scarred psychologically to lead the nation and really create a much better, hopeful and optimistic future for the Egyptian people. There are many Egyptian young men and women who are inventing amazing inventions and they want to see the light of day in this country so they can actually reap these rewards, that the whole nation reap these rewards. A lot of that is, is really stifled and stopped yeah, right now yeah. because we're spending a lot of our time talking about side conversations, and yeah, the ship is absolutely. not moving forward. Yeah. That's the key issue that I want to see happen. Well, here for us in the United States, I agree with you. Egypt is really an important country. Egypt is a country that received the second largest aid from the United States. After Israel, Israel gets the largest one, then Egypt gets the second largest. It's all in... Uh, Military aid, of course. Yes. Uh, so the American people really have a stake on what happened in Egypt. Yes. Uh, uh, how, how would the United States... Of course, the United States has a lot of influence. And if, they, if they give $1 billion every year or $1.2 billion every year to Egypt, they definitely have some influence. They couldn't, they couldn't be without influence. One billion dollar buys a lot of influence. How, how would you guys think, what, what, what the role of the United States can play in Egypt right now during this revolution? Well, I think the, uh, some uh, of the new political leaders in Egypt, including the Muslim Brothers and also the Salafi, said that we can do without, without the aid. And, and even Sheikh Al Azhar, <laughs> one time when that what that came into discussion, he said he appealed to the Egyptians, go ahead and really donate, mm -hmm. and probably in no time they can. If there are many rich Egyptians, brother Hamza, that really uh, can get the money, I don't think really the 1.2 million that goes to military aid, it does not go to the Egyptian economy or food or or utilities and so forth. Uh, would really care, uh, Egyptian would not care too much about it. But if you don't have this 1.2 million going to the military, yeah. then the military is going to draw money from the general budget of the uh, of the Egypt. Military is so very, it, we're going to make the situation no, even worse. The military is very rich and they have their m military factories and I don't think they can, I, I, I think that they can do without it. Uh, the, the question is really the, whether the Egyptian people really benefit from this one point. Two million, which has been really diverted to the military from. You don't one. have that 1.2 million you spend in the military, or if you yeah. don't spend it, yes. it's going to have to come from somewhere else. Well, the, if you need it, but again, the, I think the military has a lot of money, have a lot of of residents, have a lot of investment, have a lot of hotels. Right. Uh, they, they, do. they don't need the money. Uh, I would say I would go so far as to say that they don't uh, need money. I don't think that the military uh, is a self-sustaining entity or institution. Yeah, yeah. I think that they bolster whatever minimal, uh, whatever gap they have in their budget mm -hmm. with these, um, these, these, these investments, with, with all these things. But I don't think that they're really um, self-sustaining. If they want to achieve a self-sustaining model, then by all means, go for it because the, the nation should, could certainly use some, some extra money and some revenue and some new ideas on how to, produce, to make revenue because 
right now, uh, we're, I mean, <clears throat> Egypt could be a country that sustains itself without U.S. aid because all that money goes to the military if and only if they collect the taxes from their citizens. If they collect their personal income taxes, the Egyptian revenue will magically increase and will suddenly be a, not, a, not a budgetary issue. We'll be back to a place of, of self-sustaining governance and not relying on external fu uh, funding for, for military budget or whatever it may be. They do, they do collect taxes, of course, but, but not, not from the very rich people. <laughs> but and that the very rich. But that we'll just take it from here, the people the that can buy, can't buy bread. Big rich guys, they don't pay too much taxes. But in the Let meantime, me. I think the st stability that the Brother Ashraf talked about that is needed badly for the economic development and security, uh, and also for the source of income to each national income that really now is lost completely, and this is a tourism. That really definitely, yes. in, in billions, not the 1.2 of, uh, we lost that. Right. And we have to have a stability in order for the flow of income from tourists really to come back. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and if, I, if I may add, as, as, I was, as I was saying in the beginning, the, um, the situation in Egypt right now, and when you take a look at the government, that the government currently and Egypt as a country um, can really achieve a lot on its own. Um, uh, they just need to start helping themselves and doing the right things. When I talked at the beginning of our conversation about the American-Egyptian strategic alliance, our goal is to really help the American administration really think differently about the Middle East. We talk about a paradigm shift in American policy thinking, where what we need to re really do in the Middle East is stand by the people so that they can change their lives and improve their lives and become advanced nations that live peacefully in the Middle East and for the Middle East itself to thrive. We want a lot of Americans who love freedom and are friends of Egypt to support organizations such as the American uh, Egyptian Strategic Alliance because we need the funding and the resources on the ground in DC to really work with our leaders in, D in DC and really shift American policy in the Middle East. It is no longer about propping dictators after dictators and really seeing a lot of these countries self-destruct. What we need to see is countries that are thriving, that are stable, that are economically viable, and that are living in peace with their neighbors. Without doing so, it's unfortunate the American policy will continue to fail in the Middle East, as we have seen it do so, so many times um, uh, in, the, in the past few years. We need a shift in that policy that is very, very honest and transparent, and is really focused on helping the people rather than propping dictators in the Middle East. In the United States, uh, the policies and the monies is done for the benefit of the United States. Yes. Uh, and the Congress and the administration, you have to, 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 we're here to serve the American people. Yes. The Congress and the president, uh, primarily not to serve anybody else, but really first you have to serve the American people. Absolutely. Whatever works for the American people, that's what we're gonna do. Yes. Uh, so uh, I think it's, it's, important to, it's very important to consider that. Absolutely. But I want to pick up the point with Dr. Mitwali, who said we can do without. So, so, so you're asking that we, we in the United States cut the aid for, for Egypt? But again, should, should we cut the aid, I'm, the military? We don't need it. I'm talking about what the Egyptians leaders No, I said. want your own opinion. My mm -hmm. own opinion? Uh, I want your opinion. What does the United States need to do either to help, to, 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 to really, whatever investment we do, either in Israel or Egypt or, or anywhere around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think, as, as the brother Ashraf mentioned, really, I think his, his point is well taken. It's if the Egyptian policy is going to be really successful, uh, it has to be to the people, not dictators or not to any or, or political party. The people themselves have to feel like it is the interest of the United States to help the Egyptian people in total. And the fact that when the Secretary of State visited Egypt and some of the political parties, including one who ran for president, uh, Hamdin Sabahi, refused to meet with him, that tells the Americans a lot that maybe our, our policy is failing. We have not to support any, any of the political parties. We have to be neutral. And if we give money, it has to be invested in economic development for all the Egyptian people. Yeah, you have anything to say on that? Um, I, I, I definitely agree that 
I, I wouldn't want to see the Egyptian government go through a self-sustaining model with no support from U.S. aid, but I would like to see that U.S. aid shuffled in a different manner. I don't want to see a blank check written to the military. I'd like to see that go into programs that actually benefit the people. And for the U.S. aid that is being sent, these $1.2 billion, to be what it actually stands for, an agency for international development, not for military development. I'd like to see Egypt to be self-supporting, Honestly, I'd like uh, one day to see us not taking money from anybody, whether grants or loan or anything. Uh, I'd like them to uh, to be able to develop themselves and and uh, and move forward. I think uh, Egypt... if we if we continue to extend our hands to get money from here and there, we're going to continue right. to do that forever. Yeah. I think Egypt is very rich in natural resources, in human resources, and uh, and tourism as well. The only thing Egypt needs now is honest government, stability, and security. And if these kind of issues really are present, I'm really very optimistic yeah. Yeah, so that, that Egypt will not only survive, but it will uh, really exercise its leading role mm -hmm. in, the, in the Middle East. And I'd like to, to, to really, I, I know we're wrapping up, I'd like really to sort of tag along to what you're saying, and we really should call for a richness of hope if, in yeah. Egypt, and ask all leaders in Egypt to really live okay. up to the expectations okay. of the revolution. Well, uh, uh, we're just only almost out of time, so I'd like to thank all of you very much, and uh, we thank all the uh, audience, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. For Thanks for having us. us. Thank you.